Gosh, well, if Kelly was talking about uh, friendship, I guess I'm here to talk about the most unfriendly place you could be in, which is a prison. Um, and, uh, and if uh, the internet and other web-based media are becoming ways to develop friendship, well, that's something that prisoners are excluded from because there is no internet or web access allowed in prisons. Um, but uh, strangely enough, what I'm here to talk about is how uh, I think that prisons uh, can be rather sources of, springs of, fountains of creativity. Uh, and I say strangely, uh, you know, echoing something as you can see on the screen there by uh, the founder of the charity that I run, uh, Arthur Kersler. Um, those of you, the feminists in the room will know that Arthur Kersler is somewhat of a controversial figure. He's a bit of a mixed blessing for me running a charity as he left us his name, not his money. So I curse him every time I have to do a fundraising bid. But anyway, um, he uh, was nevertheless a remarkable man, a, a prisoner himself on three occasions, a political prisoner in the Spanish Civil War and the Second World, World War, uh, under a death sentence under one of General Franco's forces in the Spanish Civil War uh, for 90 days in a prison in Seville. Uh, Kersler had a completely life-changing experience in that prison cell. He went into it, a communist, came out of it vehemently anti-communist, uh, those of you who know his great prison novel, Darkness at Noon, will know that that's basically what the novel is about. It's a, opposed to totalitarian regimes. Uh, but Kersler settled in Britain after the war. He was a Hungarian man and got involved in all kinds of different things. But one of them was the abolition of hanging, uh, which was uh, going to come off the statute books by the early 1960s. Kersler realised people would be in prison for a very long time on long life sentences. So in 1962, he set up the Kersler Awards, uh, which have gone on to become uh, the Charitable Trust, the Kersler Trust. Uh, and British prisoners are the only prisoners in the world uh, who uh, nationally across the country we have an award scheme for our prisoners to enter their um, music on CD, their poetry, their uh, paintings, their drawings, uh, 59 different art forms. We get about 6,000 entries from prisoners across the UK. Uh, those works we get judged, they get prizes from us, they get feedback from those uh, judges and we select from them for our mentoring programme. We mentor some of our Cursor Award winners, especially to continue in the arts after release into the community. And we exhibit that work at a uh, big national annual exhibition and programme events at the South Bank Centre in London every autumn, and in Liverpool for the North West, in Edinburgh for Scotland, and we hope soon in Cardiff for Wales. Um, and uh, that is um, uh, a remarkable tradition. And I'm just going to show you some of the examples of some of the work that come through that. So you just get a flavour of the sort of art that might come out of uh, prison. And some of that, as you would expect, is very prisony in theme, uh, as in this uh, image of hands on uh, bars. Um, and you can see the contrast between the, the hard lines of the steel bars and the kind of organic and skin colours of the hands against them. Um, art, uh, most of the art that comes to us is produced in art classes in prison education departments. Uh, some of it, of course, prisoners work on their own in their cells. There are also art therapy groups in some prison settings. Uh, and then there are various art projects, often performance or writing projects, which are uh, where arts organisations go into establishments and, and, and run those. That's how the work gets created, and then people submit it through to us at the Cursor Award, and you'll see some of these have won. Uh, prizes from us. So some very prisony uh, images um, and some images which look at prison uh, but introduce an element of freedom into it. So here you see a prison cell where the, where the roof has come off and you can see uh, freedom in the sky and also something about the rather shivery image, uh, the texture of the paint I think uh, that makes it look as if the whole sort of thing might rather dissolve away and the walls might dissolve away and it be all sky. Um, and we also, of course, get many very kind of escapist images and many uh, images of wild animals, and I think they are about uh, wildness and freedom and strength and control. Uh, but also, and then in some ways, that they also, I think, become self-portraits, I think, maybe a sort of fantasy self-portrait about being um, a strong, wild bird of prey, beautifully, beautifully drawn, as you can see in that uh, case here. 
Um, and then some, in a way, quite a conventional painting, which because of its prison context gets a different slant on it. So you see, here you see a set of pictures that in any other context would be called the Four Seasons, uh, but by a prisoner is called Time Served. This was actually done by a man from a Northern Ireland prison very close to the end of a life sentence. And you can see he's been thinking about how time has changed while he's been in prison. But maybe the essential hymn the trunk in the middle of the tree stays the same on the top of that hill despite the changing seasons. There's something about, I think, you know, there's a change, but there's also something that stays the same, that stays true. Um, and of course, so self-portraits are uh, a key theme that we see in prison art. In a way, when somebody, a judge sends somebody down in a courtroom, in a way they're saying, go have a, a, a long, hard look at yourself. Maybe the arts are one of the best ways to do that. And here I think you see a man who has looked himself squarely in the face. He has a darker side, he has a lighter side. Uh, I think colour is interesting in this. Colour, of course, ethnicity colour is a fascinating issue in prisons. Black and minority ethnic groups are huge, hugely overrepresented in our prison population. Here's a man who's conveyed himself, uh, clearly a black African Caribbean man who has not painted himself in cliched chocolate colours, but has used all kinds of different colours. I think he's somebody saying, I'm neither black nor white, I'm multifaceted, I'm multicoloured. Um, so, uh, the arts, uh, and of course this is clearly why we operate as a charity, this is how I raise money for our work, is that they have all kinds of benefits for um, offenders. Uh, some of those benefits I often think are closer to what the Daily Mail might, might like to see prisoners doing. They are about discipline and hard work. Any of us who try to uh, progress in the arts will, re will realise how much they require that. They are about collaboration, they are about working together, they are about producing hope and future. They are, of course, about learning technical new skills. And then there are, there are therapeutic benefits about getting feelings out and objectifying them uh, and so on. Um, and we see people's lives again and again changed by the arts uh, through, who come through our cursed rewards and other processes. But what I want to in a way share with you all today is that despite that's how I raise my money, that something slightly more complicated I think actually happens with the arts. And with art, as soon as you try and put an agenda on art, it sort of slips out of it. What would, what, would, what would be therapeutic or what would be the sort of skills and things learnt out of a piece like this? This is a very, this is a piece I think which, in which it seems hard to know how you'd escape from it. There's very few certainties, everything slips and slides around. Although actually, this is one of the, this artist, the paint, this is dropped up in Biro. Uh, this man is now out of prison along our um, mentoring scheme. He actually sells his work and he's started to make quite a good living out of it, so maybe. Um, or if you look at a piece like this, which is far from the kind of calming, soothing uh, effect that uh, art is sometimes supposed to have. Uh, this is, I think, a protest painting. Uh, there's a man in his cell with this brick wall straight down the middle of the picture, dividing him off from the more colourful world out on the landing, which I don't know if you can see, but there is. And let me just emphasize, there are a lot of very caring and excellent prison officers working in the prison system, but here we have one who is jangling his keys and whistling a tune and ignoring this man in the cell who is cracking up on the other side of that wall. Or a piece like this, a very sophisticated painting, this uh, by uh, another man who's on our mentoring programme who developed a remarkable sort of surrealist uh, painting technique. Uh, and he's in, he was in Grendon Prison, which is the one therapeutic prison in the prison system. And I think this is a, uh, this is a very strange work, but I think one of these it might be about is about sort of having to drag stuff out therapeutically from yourself, some of, the, uh, some of the damage inside it. But you can see this extraordinary knife and this strange contortions. Um, not a piece that it would be easy to say, oh yes, that's, cal that's going to calm down a violent offender and make them much more, you know, resettle in the community. Um, and of course there is a very different uh, narrative of uh, what prison uh, art should be, which is exemplified by this rather lovely piece that appeared in the uh, Sunday Express about our exhibition in Liverpool uh, about five or six weeks ago, um, where um, a journalist claimed that, we, that if you went there you would be confronted with a sculpture of the Moors murderer Ian Brady, allegedly done by one of his fellow inmates at 
Ashworth Special Hospital in Merseyside. I don't even know if he read is he in Ashworth Special Hospital, but I tell you the staff there would never have let a sculpture of him out. Uh, any of you who know your sort of pop music will know that the man in black, which is actually what this sculpture was called, this little black ceramic head, uh, is actually Johnny Cash. So um, uh, that was quite interesting because when we tried to get positive media coverage of the exhibition, we couldn't, it was, we couldn't quite get on to BBC Radio Merseyside. Of course, once this had been published, we were invited straight on to the morning news programme. We worked out with Johnny Cash before we went on the news, but I was going to wait and say that on air because it got me on the news and of course that brought people into the exhibition and uh, um, so it's funny how even that, uh, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, the, the, our, our enemies can end up playing into our hands in some ways. Very interesting the way they picked out that phrase self-esteem, which is of course is one of the cliches of my field is that we say this helps people's self-esteem. People think that, uh, might think that means uh, self-esteem is about being smug or pleased with yourself. Self-esteem is about being able to judge yourself appropriately, to assess, to esteem yourself. So both to know what things are good, whether you have good and potential to go and make a new life for yourself, but also to be able to look squarely at the things that you've done wrong that you need to change and, uh, and, and grow. But it's very interesting that that's one of the things that they kind of uh, threw back at us. But uh, anyway, I rather like the fact that I run a charity which runs six displays. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I guess in a way there are, I'm not sure I've quite got these terms right, but there are sort of three narratives about uh, this rather strange world I live in with a foot in the prison world, a foot in the art world. Uh, and one of those is the kind of liberal perspective, which I think, you know, which is where I have it most of the time, I'm sure most of us in this room do, which is, you know, art is a good thing for prisoners. That means it's going to be good for victims of crime because it will help them rehabilitate art. You know, art, art is, uh, you know, is good for prisoners. Uh, that those journalists in the Sunday Express clearly think art is too good for prisoners. It's not something prisoners should be allowed to do. Or as a journalist on The Sun said to me on a... TV chat program thing I did once. The art is what you do on holiday, isn't it? Not what you do in prison, uh, which is you know somewhat denigrating to the thousands of people who produce art in the building like this and so on. But anyway, that was. Uh, but there's clearly that uh, view there. But then I suppose what I think is that in a strange sort of way, what interests me is that in a way, prisoners have an advantage over the rest of us in the terms of terms of art. Uh, they, of course, have time. They're taken out of the mainstream of society, so they get a particular perspective on it. And they're controlled by that society. They're there especially because society has defined that to the space that they should be in. Uh, and that it is, of course, in those times of difficulty in life, as it was for Arthur Kirsten in prison cell in the Spanish Civil War, uh, can be the moments that generate the most change and uh, growth and inspiration for us. So, funnily enough, what I think is, funnily enough, prison is, is good for art. Um, and um, uh, I've just sort of, uh, this is something where I'm sort of, I'm sharing with you half-baked thoughts that I would welcome your thoughts on how to develop it. But um, uh, that title of Maya Angelou's autobiography from the late 60s, which of course went on became a series of autobiographies of her, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Now she was talking about the oppression of black people and of, uh, of women in a you know, particular social context in America at the time. But it's, but she's, but of course she's absolutely right. But the reason the caged bird sings is because the is because the bird is caged. There is something about being in that containment that will make people feel the need to express themselves. Uh, and actually, I didn't want to quote it because it would take too long, but the, the really great examples of that are in the, the work of America's greatest writer, I'd serve that as a timeless truth, Emily Dickinson, uh, who limited herself to living almost in one house for her entire, well, in one house for her entire life, almost entirely one town for her life, limited to, to a very, very small world from which she had a kind of Shakespearean global uh, view through her extraordinary poetry in mid-19th century America. Um, now, of course, it is one of those things, if you start to say, well, con you know, containment is good for creativity, you can start to end up saying it's good for people to suffer. There's something about trying to say this in rational terms or in prose, sorry, I don't mean to be, as a poet, be denigrating to prose writers, but, but, it, but, but there's something that you end up saying the wrong thing if you try and say it rationally, and it is only through art, through a 
through, through a media which can hold together different meanings at one time in a dynamic relationship and you can be able to say and understand uh, what I'm trying to, to, to grasp at here about that complex relationship between, uh, well, imprisonment and creativity. Um, and I'll just end with just a couple of little examples of that, one visual and one poem, and this is the visual one. Uh, which won one of our top awards for drawing. It's a pen and ink drawing from Liverpool uh, Prison, uh, which was actually produced uh, as the backdrop for um, a play written by one of our other Cursor Award winners, and he commissioned this work as the backdrop for it. It was projected onto the back of the stage in the theatre uh, in London when the play was shown. And the, the scene in the play was about two drug users injecting heroin uh, while they were hiding underneath the escalator at Green Park Tube Station. And actually what this picture is, is the escalator at Green Park Tube Station. You can just see the blunt and underground sign on its breast on this, on this side of the picture. Uh, the, uh, the, the escalator turned into a dragon, so chasing the dragon, which is one of the phrases for, uh, for that kind of drug taking. And it's a fascinating piece with the reference to the Bob Dylan song. Uh, I think this is a prisoner saying uh, something quite complex about um, a system turns me into a machine, turns me into some kind of monster. I feel like I'm an, I'm, uh, an android from, uh, from another planet uh, that, that has been put in this strange world of prison and I'm kind of screaming out, there's fire coming out of my mouth as a result of, of this. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a wonderfully funny, witty, moving, terrifying uh, piece, that. Um, and then I'll just finish with a poem, uh, which is this. This is um, from Lewis Prison in, uh, in Sussex. I'll just need to stand here so I can read it. The sky is high. The fence is high. The wall is high. The ceiling is high. I am not high. Another drug piece, of course, on one level. Uh, here is probably a man who has been, uh, who's been a drug user, who's managed to kick the habit while in prison. Uh, or, you know, at least hasn't been able to get his supply of drugs there, though you can, of course, but uh, he hasn't, so he's not high. So he's seen clearly, maybe, for the first time. And I just think in a very set of very simple images, it's very interesting what he conveys. The sky is high, so, so the heavens are a very, seem a very long way off. A perfect, ideal, natural world escape seems a very long way away. Yes, I think that might be that implication. Uh, and there is a fence and a wall that are both high. They're, they're blocking that out. So they're, they're, you can't get over them. They're too high to get past. Uh, the ceiling is very high as well, so it, it's difficult for me to reach the top of my potential to where I'd really like to be. But I am not high. I'm not off my face. I'm not, I can, um, I, 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 might be, I might be lonely. I'm not high. I'm just, I'm just a prisoner. But actually, I, what that means is I can see clearly what there is around me. I can see both the potential of the sky and I can see the fences that stop me getting to that sky. Uh, and in a strange kind of way, uh, I think that is the sort of spiritual blessing that Arthur Kirstler was talking about, which rather oddly means that uh, the 84,000 people held in our prisons at the moment, I think, actually have an advantage over the, those of us sitting in this room uh, when it comes to creativity. Thank you.